Dungeons and Dragons is one of over 300 fantasy role-playing games on the market today. At least 4 million players have accepted the invitation to enter into the fantasy dream world of sorcery, swords, and demons. Dungeons and Dragons is the most effectively, most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, the most thoroughly researched introduction to the occult in man's recorded history. Dungeons and Dragons. Some claim it's a simple, harmless game. Um... Well, this game affects the most intelligent of our children. But as we'll see in the upcoming few moments, the problems with role-playing games have moved far beyond Dungeons and Dragons. He was a publicity hound, and uh, he knew that he could hang it on D&D and gather a lot of media frenzy, and he did. Dungeons and Dragons, everyone's favorite tabletop role-playing game. But you see, Dungeons and Dragons, my Zoomer friends, has not always been the mainstream behemoth that it is today. In fact, for a long time, it was really only a game that absolute nerds and theater degens played. That is why in today's video, I want to tell you all about the worst Dungeons and Dragons movie ever made. A movie that is a true embodiment of the satanic panic of the 1980s, a little movie called Mazes and Monsters. Now, before we even get to the movie, first, I need you all to cast your mind back to 1979. The Cold War was at its height. President Jimmy Carter was duking it out with former actor and political outsider Ronald Reagan, and all throughout America, nerdy teens and college students were being exposed to this strange fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons. But what is Dungeons and Dragons? Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop fantasy role-playing game where a dungeon master or DM guides a group of players or the party in a collaborative storytelling session. You got your character, your character's got a bunch of stats, you got your backstory, you got your classes, you roll a bunch of dice, bada bing, bada boom. I mean, come on guys, it's 2024. Everyone is somewhat familiar with D&D, right? By this point in 1979, Dungeons and Dragons was five years old. What originally started as a pamphlet created by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson by their game publishing company, TSR, most recently in that year, had released what would become its core rule books, the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual. By this point in the game's life, it was becoming a little bit popular. According to Gary Gygax, around this time, he estimated around 100,000 people were playing Dungeons & Dragons in 1978, a number that would explode to the millions in only a few years' time. However, I don't think that Gary Gygax and the folks over at TSR could have predicted the series of events that would eventually lead to this explosion of players. Enter into our story, child prodigy James Dallas Egbert III, or better known as Dallas. Dallas, as I said, was a child prodigy who in 1979 was enrolled at Michigan State University in the computer science program at only the age of 16. On August 5th, 1979, Dallas would go missing from his dormitory, reportedly leaving a note stating his intention to delete himself. Seven days later, on August 22nd, Egbert's parents would hire private investigator William Dare to locate their son, as Dallas's mother reportedly has lost confidence in the Michigan police, as apparently the cops didn't inform her that her son was missing until five days after he was last seen. Two days later, Michael Stewart, a journalist for the local university paper, published details of Dallas's disappearance, which very quickly caught the mainstream media's eye. During Deere's investigation, he would come to learn that the young Dallas was an avid lover of Dungeons and Dragons. According to Deere, when he investigated Dallas's room, he found a corkboard laden with strange series of tacks. Deere, in his 1984 book, The Dungeon Master, and in subsequent interviews, has said that the shape resembled a building that was part of a network of underground campus steam tunnels, which he later found out that students on campus would explore, some of them even playing, Dungeons and Dragons in these tunnels. Now, the police at the time had theorized that Dallas's disappearance may be linked with the Dungeons and Dragons playing in the tunnels, and many people were just now beginning to question the kind of morality, we'll say, of Dungeons and Dragons, including seemingly William Deere at the time, who then began publicly pushing his theory that Dungeons and Dragons was in fact involved in Dallas's disappearance something later that would be proven to not be the case at all. PI, along with several student volunteers, 
volunteers scoured these tunnels, but they could find no traits of Dallas anywhere. This speculative theory that the PI had pushed about Dungeons and Dragons and Dallas's disappearance was beginning to take the nation by storm, as media all over the nation began running wild with this narrative and created an uproar among parents everywhere over the apparent psychological effects of role-playing games and the many wild theories that would become popular suggesting that Dungeons and Dragons was an evil cult worshipping Satan. And as such, the satanic panic had begun. In reality though, what ended up happening to Dallas was even more tragic. Dallas on August 5th, 1979, had ventured into these university steam tunnels with plans to delete himself, taking a large dose of a hypnotic sedative. However though, the following day, Dallas would wake up from his drug-induced sleep and in a panic state of mental disarray. As such, he would go to his friend's house where he remained in hiding for a series of days. There, he would take a bus to New Orleans where once again, he would attempt to delete himself via cyanide, but this also failed. A few days later, Dallas would contact the PI, William Deere, hired by his mother, informing him of his location and asking him to pick him up. Dallas would later reveal all of these details of the story to Deer, clearing up the fact that Dungeons and Dragons had nothing to do with his disappearance at all, but made him swear to conceal the truth, which he did so until the release of his book until 1984. Dallas was then released to the custody of his parents as he was still a minor at this time, However, tragically, a year later, on August 10th, 1980, James Dallas Egbert III would die of a self-inflicted gunshot wound at Grandview Hospital in his hometown of Dayton, Ohio. Dallas' story is regarded by many to be one of kind of two primary catalysts to this moral panic that would surround Dungeons & Dragons from the 1980s to the 1990s where numerous murders and crimes were irrationally being linked to this role-playing game, as people seem to think that Dungeons & Dragons was a baby-eating and sacrificing cult that worshipped Satan. Wait a second, I, I feel like I've heard that one before. Now the story of Dallas you see is extremely important to the film we are about to discuss because it would go on to inspire Rona Jaffe, no relation to Critical Role star Taliesin Jaffe, trust me, I checked, to later publish the novel Monsters and Mazes, a fictional story about how a young college student has a psychotic break from reality when playing Dungeons and Dragons, <coughs> I mean mazes and monsters with his friends. We can't use the word Dungeons and Dragons because they'd probably sue us. This book was released in 1981 amidst the overgrowing panic building around D&D &D and a year after the death of Dallas. Author Rona Jaffe had managed to poison her audience, many of which had never even heard of a tabletop role-playing game before this point, now believing that the version in her story was a accurate depiction of reality when in fact it was f***ing not. And wow did this book do well in this climate of moral panic around Dungeons and Dragons, so well in fact they decided to release a TV only movie. Monster and Mazes, the movie, featuring Tom Hanks. Mazes and Monsters is a far out game. Swords, poison, spells, battles, maiming, killing. Hey, it's all imagination. Is it? Enter our four primary characters for this story. JJ, a 16-year-old genius college student with an aloof rich mother. Wow, I wonder who inspired this character. Kate Finch, an aspiring writer and college student who struggles in her relationships with men as she feels her strong character scares them off. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is just our author self-inserting herself into this story. Daniel, the attractive, gifted computer programmer who just wants to create computer games. And our main man, Robbie, the new transfer student with a rocky home life. Early on in the film, we learned that Robbie was kicked out of his old university because he didn't attend class, as he was too busy playing Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, shit, 
I mean mazes and monsters, it's definitely completely different, guys. Definitely not Dungeons and Dragons. The film opens with a police detective speaking to a member of the media about an incident that has occurred involving a couple of college kids in the game Mazes and Monsters, and how this game seemingly got out of hand in this dangerous set of caves outside of the town. Remember this scene. Our story then flashes several months into the past where we are introduced to our main set of characters. We see that college friends Kate, Daniel, and JJ are looking for a new player for their Monsters and Mazes game. Robbie, Tom Hanks' character, ends up meeting Kate at one of JJ's parties, instantly hitting it off with her as the two begin connecting over their love of Monsters and Mazes. I played a game called Mazes and Monsters a little too much. You're kidding. What level? Uh, ninth. Ninth level. So am I. This dialogue scene absolutely fucking kills me. Why, yes, hello, fellow gamer. I am also level nine. Shall we level nine together? It's hilarious that they think that like D&D nerds like actually talk like this. Kate and her friends beg Robbie to join their campaign and he begrudgingly agrees, seemingly only to hang out with Kate more. Fast forward to their first D&D sesh where we are introduced to Robbie's character, the holy man, Pardu, a man of faith who only uses violence as a last option. We then get this insanely cringy montage of Robbie and Kate falling in love. I mean, just listen to this music. Cringe. Later, Robbie reveals to Kate that years ago, his older brother Hall had run away from home, seemingly to go to New York City, and his family has never seen him since. This loss of his brother seemingly haunts Robbie, who tells Kate that he dreams about him often, in which we see in the following scene. Because of Robbie and Kate's relationship growing, the group haven't been playing Monsters and Mazes that often, and we learn that JJ, the 16-year-old college student genius, is very lonely, being the fact that he is probably the only teenager that young on campus. We then get this really weird scene of JJ alone in his room, talking to his pet bird about how he wants to delete himself. According to him, so the world will remember the death of a boy genius, and he decides that there's no better place to do it than the mysterious Peakward caverns that have been closed off to the public. Yeah, those caverns from the opening scene. They talk about it forever. And be immortal. Also, again, how on the nose does our author have to be in referencing Dallas's death in her book? It's honestly kind of gross. We then get a scene of JJ going and exploring these caves, and then a really awkward scene of Robbie asking Kate to live with him, which she shoots down instantly, basically saying, Yo, bro, it's way too soon. Oh, it's too soon. We then get another scene of the group finally playing monsters and mazes with one another when JJ decides that his character is going to brazenly jump into a dangerous pit to search for treasure. However, the pit is trapped and JJ's character instantly dies. Gotta love classic Dungeons and Dragons. JJ argues with Daniel the DM over his character's death for a second, something that's probably the most accurate representation of your classic quite casual Dungeons and Dragons game. If you've played Dungeons and Dragons enough, you've experienced this type of player before. Well, I didn't kill him. Did so. You weren't paying attention. It's then though that JJ, after the death of his character, proposes a new game. According to him, the most real versions of Monsters and Mazes that anyone ever has ever played, as he proposes they play in Peakwood Caverns. The next night, the group set off in costumes stolen from the theater department to go LARP in these dangerous caves. While in the caves, the group decide to split up in search of herbs that they need for their quest. While alone, JJ the DM rolls a random encounter, shouting throughout the cavern, MONSTER! We flash back to Robbie, who begins to panic as he begins to hear sounds, and suddenly from the shadows, a monster appears before him. He screams out in absolute terror, yelling for help for his friends. As he does so, he draws a small knife from his waist and stabs the monster. Moments later, the group comes running to find Robbie, who tells them that everything is okay. He says that he slayed the beast, but when the camera turns, there's nothing there. After having completed their session, the group leave, all laughing with one another, all of them seemingly really pleased with how much fun that they had that night LARPing in these caves. 
But something is wrong with Robbie. He is seemingly upset that he, as a holy man and his character, had to resort to violence to solve his problem. It's then Kate responds with probably the most obvious instance of foreshadowing I've ever seen in any movie ever, saying this. The most frightening monsters are the ones that exist in our minds. Wow, it's almost like this movie is trying to push a narrative that D&D makes children mentally unstable. At this point, it's very obvious to us, the audience, that Robbie is having some sort of psychological psychotic break with reality as over the next few days, we see him continuously go in and out of character in his daily life. At night, he is plagued with a new set of dreams. A strange man named the Great Hall calls out to him, referring to him as Pardu. The Great Hall tells him in order to reach the highest levels of his craft as a holy man, he must be holy in all aspects of his life. Specifically, he must be celibate. And then one day when he is ready, he must come to the two towers and be one with the Great Hall. The next day, Kate comes to Robbie's room for some loving time. When out of nowhere, Robbie breaks up with her, telling her that he loves her, but he just can't be with her. Of course, we, the audience, know the real reason for Robbie ending their relationship. It's all from his dreams. Fast forward an indiscriminate amount of time and we see Kate and Daniel having dinner in a bar. She says that she is worried about Robbie, noting that Robbie continues to stay in character throughout his daily life. Daniel, for some reason, downplays the f out of this and then the two end up getting together and making out. Guys, meanwhile, we see that Robbie has another dream, this time the Great Hall telling Robbie to find the secret city hidden beneath the earth once he has fully purified his mind and his body. After a Halloween party where Robbie goes dressed up as his character Pardu, Daniel visits his room, but he is gone. Later, Daniel returns with their group, the group of friends, to search the room where they find a strange map titled Two Towers that Robbie has been seemingly working on and hiding from his friends. After searching everywhere for Robbie and even calling his parents, they decide to look in the only place that they assume he would be, the caves, but they are unable to find him. Are you starting to see the uh, parallels with one Dallas Egbert yet? Reluctantly, the groups go to the cops, lying to them, telling them that Robbie has always had this weird fascination with the caves, and it's possible that he would go inside of them to play uh, monsters in mazes, but with another group of friends, definitely not with them. As basically everyone in this movie outside of our main cast of core friends of characters here are relatively suspicious on monsters in mazes as a game. We flash back to the very first opening scene of the film with the police investigating the tunnels, but we learn that they find nothing. The detective believes that if Robbie was in the caves, he's likely dead. And it's very possible that one of his fellow Monsters and Mazes player killed him, as according to him, Monsters and Mazes is a perverted game about monsters, demons, and violence and death. I mean, Jesus, how on the nose can our author get here? With Robbie still not found, Kate has this eureka moment, realizing that the Great Hall on Robbie's map is not a place, it's a person. It's referring to Robbie's brother Hall, who went missing years ago when he left for New York City. It's then our scene flashes to a confused Robbie, who believes that he is Pardu, wandering through the streets of New York City. That is, until he gets jumped by these two hooligans in this alley. But Robbie does not see the humans before him. All he sees are monsters from the game. Robbie, believing that he is Pardew, attempts to cast spells on the muggers to no avail because, well, he's not an actual, like, holy man cleric wizard, is he? Being backed into a corner, he pulls out his small knife, stabbing the mugger who falls dead in front of him. Later, after looking into a mirror, Robbie comes to. Still covered in blood with tears streaming down his face, he calls Kate from a payphone, telling her everything that has happened. Look, man, I may be a law school dropout, but that looks like self-defense to me. Kate tells Robbie to meet them at JJ's home in New York City 
as they will be driving there to get him right away. Robbie, though, again gets lost in his own mental delusions and in a panic finds himself in the tunnel system beneath the New York subway. This further plays into his delusions as he believes that this is the city underground that he learned about in his dream. There, Robbie, who once again believes that he is Pardu, meets a homeless man who he believes is just a wise old sage. Robbie tells the homeless man that he is searching for the Great Hall and the Two Towers. So what does he do? Well, he sends him to the World Fucking Trade Center. Meanwhile, Kate and the gang have arrived at JJ's house, but Robbie is nowhere to be seen. But don't worry, because JJ, with his fat prodigy brain, realizes that the Two Towers is not a Tolkien reference, but must be a reference to the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center. The movie then enters its climax as the group bursts onto the roof of the World Trade Center to see Robbie attempting to jump over the railing. Robbie, believing he is Pardu, tells his friends that he is going to cast Fly on himself so he can go and meet the Great Hall. But luckily, his friends managed to break through to him and talk him down from the edge. We fast forward three months later. Apparently, everything is just going amazingly well for Kate, JJ, and Daniel. Kate, having finally cured her writer's block that she mentioned at the very beginning when her character was introduced, has decided that she is going to write a story about the events that just happened to them. JJ decides that he's going to be a film director, and Daniel is seemingly happy having decided that he's going to give up on making games, I guess, and will just be a computer software tech. Yeah, they really were trying to kind of neatly wrap up all of their stories here with this one. Our final scene comes when these three friends go and visit Robbie at his home, as according to them, Robbie has been seeing a doctor and is doing really well now. The group rush to see Robbie, who is sitting outside of his home next to this nice-ass pond on their property, but their faces drop in horror as Robbie begins speaking as Pardu, addressing all of them, as their roleplay characters. Robbie seemingly has completely fallen into his delusions and believes truly that he is Pardu and that his own mother and father are just kind innkeepers who let him stay there. He even tells his friends that he has a magical coin, which he pays the innkeeper with, but then magically returns to his pocket every night. Obviously, this is his parents who are just putting it back for him, further playing into his delusions. As well, he tells his friends of a dark forest just across the pond that he believes is filled with evil, but together they must purify it. So after this entire movie and story, what do the group of friends do? Well, they play into his delusions, going on with Robbie's fantasy that he himself is actually Pardu, and the movie ends. This movie and the book that it was based off of, they really piss me off. First off, as a movie, as a piece of film or cinema, it's absolutely hot garbage, though I am impressed that somehow Tom Aches was able to somewhat save this movie at times with a few good scenes of acting. Most of the acting, though, is pretty garbage, but to be fair, the script itself is pretty garbage. The pacing of this film is all over the fucking place. There's a bunch of really weird, basically useless scenes that very easily could have been cut from this film, or at the least just condensed down dramatically. Like, there's a bunch of really weird cuts, like, back and forth between perspectives when characters are on their own, that a lot of them could have just been left out of the film altogether, not to mention a couple of really weird jump cuts, and I don't know what was going on with the editing there. And don't even get me started on how goddamn awful that 80s love music montage scene was. And on top of all of that probably undefensible worst of the lot is the fact that this movie and the book that it was based off of helped to reinforce the crazy moral panic that was going through America at this time. These strange conspiracy theories that Dungeons and Dragons was some sort of satanic cult where they would sacrifice babies and eat children and really, as well, this other f***ed up theory that Dungeons and Dragons somehow was linked to psychotic breaks of reality and was harmful to the psyches of young people. The fact is that this story was extremely obviously inspired from the death of a very troubled young man, and I find that f disgusting. Ultimately, though, I guess it was Dungeons and Dragons and Gary Gagax who really got the last laugh out of all of this, as the satanic panic 
ended up having basically the opposite effect that it intended. Instead of driving people away from the game, instead it gave Dungeons and Dragons a massive spotlight which propelled it into the mainstream and it increased their player base from a couple of hundred thousands at the end of the 1970s to millions in only just a few years. So next time you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, remember to give a thanks to all of the crazy satanic panic, moral panic people out there in the 80s and 90s as if it wasn't for them, this game, this community wouldn't nearly be as big as it is now. <laughs> And yes, this was the story of hands down the worst Dungeons and Dragons movie and book of all time, Mazes and Monsters. If you did enjoy this video, why don't you like, comment, and subscribe as these videos take a while for me to make and research. And the easiest way that you can help support the channel is your engagement as your engagement with the video helps to put it into the algorithm. If you did enjoy this video, then why don't you check out some of our other videos on screen now. As always guys, you know the drill, drink your water, hug your mother. Until next time, peace, love, auto.